that those are the situations. Now, something that always troubled me was uh, Einstein and his, his statements about God. And the rabbi asked Einstein to simply, do you believe in God? He said, and I thought this was a wonderful statement, I believe in Spinoza's God who reveals himself in the orderly harmony of what exists, not in a God who concerns himself with fates and actions of human beings. I found that a very profound statement. And I was actually in San Diego some time ago, and in a bookshop I found this book on Spinoza, and I thought that was interesting. So who just, who was this guy? Spinoza lived in Amsterdam. Oh, by the way, it's a book called Spinoza in 90 Minutes by Paul Strathern. 90 Minutes was about as much as I would give a philosopher, actually, at the time. But after today's fantastic uh, uh, presentation on Spinoza, I'm going to give it maybe 100. <laughs> he, um, I, I'm going to get that book. Uh, he sent a letter to the synagogue authorities. He outlined in precise detail his philosophical views, backing them with logical arguments which he claimed were irrefutable. The synagogue authorities decided they had no alternative. They would have to demonstrate to the Christian community that they long, no longer would have anything to do with this guy. As far as they were concerned, Spinoza was a non-person, an ex-Jew. In a grand ceremony of excommunication, Spinoza was banished from the Jewish community. A great horn was blown, candles were extinguished one by one, and a curse was read out. With the judgment of angels and saints, we hereby excommunicate, execrate, and anathematize Baruch de Espinosa. And curse be he by day. There's no sound. Okay. Oh, well. Let's improvise. Okay. Let's go back. No sound. Can we do anything about the sound? Oh, that's... We can take the sound. Okay. I had some sound for you. Um, and curse be he by night. He's lying down. Kirsten is rising up. Kirsten is rising up. The Lord shall destroy his name under the sun. You've got to improvise in this, in this technical world. Under the sun and cut him off for his undoing from all the tribes of Israel. None may speak with him by word of mouth, nor by writing, nor show any favor to him, nor by be under one roof with him, nor come within four cubits of him, nor read any document written by him. Well, I, I mean, you know, I'm a 60s guy. I've just got to read this guy. Uh, but unfortunately, it's in Latin. Okay. Um, now, Paul Strathern makes this statement. A universal God who can be properly apprehended only by the application of reason to the world around us. This suggests that Spinoza's religion of disenchantment could, in fact, be a prescient description of modern science, a pantheistic universe whose truth we can apprehend only by the use of reason, mathematics, and rational experiment. And now very happy to realize that Spinoza is not even pantheistic. So that was where we start. I've done a few things, and I want to give you some examples of my little attempts to do something. And that is, I've interviewed a lot of Nobel laureates, including Charlie Towns, and talked to him about the Templeton Foundation. But I'll just give you one. Uh, these are all people. And one is uh, use, uh, Herb Cromer, um, and uh, hopefully, I may hopefully come bring this down, okay? Okay, I've got to um, get into the right bit of this, which is, I think, about here. Insight into the world and why it's here. No. That's quite definite. No, I seem to yes. hear. <laughs> you have no belief that there's an afterlife. That's correct. And in the pattern of elementary particles and the constants that I mentioned and so on, you don't see the evidence of a designer? No, I don't. I think Could you say more about it? I think this is wishful thinking. Wishful? Yes. I mean, if some people, uh, if they ask, uh, um, there are some people who see the evidence of some sort of design, and I just do not accept that thinking. I have no desire whatsoever to push this view on others. Uh, and uh, if you hadn't asked me about this, I wouldn't have mentioned it. But I'm also not reluctant uh, to say so when I'm asked. Now, I've uh, discussed this with, and um, we have discussed it with a lot of Nobel Prize winners, and it's about nine to one against, and they're mainly atheists. Um, and that's, I think, 
it's on the internet, on our website, and one can start to uh, at least propagate some of the views of people who are scientists, and that has been one of my aims. The problem okay, for me is, the, is that there's not really much difference between the irrationality of the firm believer dedicated to humanitarian and socially responsible activity and the fundamentalist extremists. They're just interpreting the mystical indoctrination they have had in different ways. Now, Deborah McKenzie in The New Scientist offers some sage advice for those free thinkers who argue rationally with fundamentalist thought but make little headway. The challenge for the secular inheritors of the Enlightenment is to remain true to their values and to be tolerant and pluralistic, even in the face of an opponent who can never reciprocate. That means understanding fundamentalist mentality and at least not adding to the alienation that inspires the more extreme among them. Something that I have a problem doing, I must admit. Um, we must accept seriously held public belief as, normal part, as a normal part of modern living, says Davy. The more you deny and attack it, the more defensive it gets. So what are we to do? And uh, I think an indication for me is um, the present pope. I, I can't understand how he can see me as, as, a, as an enemy, but he does. A leading contender to become the next pope, which was before he was the pope, launched a fierce attack on the forces of secularism yesterday, arguing that they were fostering intolerance in Europe and forcing Christianity underground. Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger, 77, one of the Vatican's most powerful figures, issued a rallying cry to the faithful saying that the liberal consensus had now evolved into a worrying and aggressive ideology. I think it's true. It's very difficult for me to put myself in his place. I assume that he truly believes that we are the most dangerous people as far as the Catholic Church. And certainly a large number of his flock do. And I think it's true that many of the Muslims, I mean, you, they must really see the West or some of us in America as, as dangerous to themselves as I think we do see them, as Sam and I, I feel that same way too. I don't understand that, but I think it's something that we have to recognize. And now, of course, he is the Pope. So I've been involved in the global citizenship program. It's really only just starting um, because it seems to me that we need to weld uh, a, sort of, a sort of humanity sans frontier. I don't know how we can do that. Um, and decide on our goals and recognize that confronting religion may be counterproductive. I, I don't know, some people would say. However hard it is, there may be more to gain by clenching our teeth and collaborating with those truly humanitarian factions, whatever persuasion they might have. And I'm involved in trying to set up a website for uh, Albert Einstein and Joseph Rotblatt. Uh, Joe is the greatest man I ever knew personally. And uh, to try to put their anti-nationalism, anti-patriotism, and, uh, and in fact, their anti-religious uh, attitudes and uh, somewhere up on, as an agenda. I come now to my fantastic colleague, John Cornforth, who wrote an article which is on this website on scientists and uh, citizens, and he writes so eloquently, the scientist's true strength is something which I can put no better than Shaw in his all but forgotten play back to Methuselah. But my ways did not work, and theirs did, and they were able to tell me why. That is their strength over me. They seek no other power. Scientists, says Kappa, need to try harder to show that true strength, which is essentially is that they thrive on being doubted. In this, they differ from all others among the shapers of society. We have to show that, you know, penicillin, these are bacteria that are breaking up because the shell can't break. And that in nine days, this girl was actually essentially cured. We've got to talk to our young people and show the humanity of chemistry, the humanity of the sciences. In fact, this is amputation without anesthetics. Uh, and just get them to think what it was like in that old world without the sciences. I do workshops with small children. These are eight to nine-year-olds in Mexico. I'm doing it on the internet now. I did one last Monday, a week last Monday, to Venezuela. I couldn't go to Venezuela. Science is universal, as we have all know. I mean, science is, the only, I think, the only truly universal culture. Whatever your color, I love this picture from a couple of kids in one of my little workshops. Whatever your personal philosophy or that of your parents, 
This was in Malaysia. And these, this kid was uh, is in Iceland. I couldn't go to Iceland, but they sent me this photograph of the workshop, the buckyball workshop that I did to Iceland. Scientists as citizen, Kappa addresses some shortcomings as well of the scientific community. Uh, it's not just all good. He does that as well. I set up a, a website many years ago, and, uh, um, and what was the aim? To create a platform for scientists to communicate directly without the medium of a media mogul. This is it. We've got discussion programs, lectures, careers programs, interviews, workshops for young children, teachers' resources, and major issues. We deal with a lot of things. Every year I have another thought, I'll do something else. I've got, I'm free to do with this website what I want and let scientists say what they want. On the scientific discussion, we've pioneered a new concept in TV debate. Participants should actually understand the subject. You know what I mean. We've got careers programs, a day in the life of a young scientist. We're, we're discussing DDT. It's probably saved, I don't know, half a billion lives. How many? We don't know. This is the man's greatest enemy, actually. It's killing two million kids every year in South Africa. Let's get a perspective on this. We've got Max Perutz, who got the structure of hemoglobin. Joseph Rotblatt, who spent almost all his life trying to stop the spread of nuclear weapons, died when he was 97 just last year. He was the greatest man I ever knew personally. We interviewed him, and he's on our website. Um, we've got uh, programs on the brain. The head go transparent, revealing the outside of the brain. Perhaps you can get a sentiment of the power of the technique, because now we are visualizing those water molecules that have memory constants characteristic of brain rather than facial muscle tissue. Well, our resident skeptic may say, look, you could do that on the slab in a post-mortem room, but I'd like to hope I can be forgiven for not submitting myself to the inconvenience of that particular experiment. Anyway, it's bad practice to teach graduate students to do experiments that they can't repeat several times. Um, humor's also good, and people think that scientists are not humorous and can't tell jokes. These are the people who've helped me, John Hare, Chris Dean, Chris Ewells, Ed Goldwyn, Richard Iskin, Joe Watson, to create this particular site. But I want to now go to some new technology that you can all have in your own office. There are new technology where you can make programs yourself and put them on, in, onto a URL, um, basically. Um, the, um, this is one of them. And you can have the video on one side and the PowerPoint or whiteboard on the other. And we're experimenting from a Florida state. And one reason why I'm there is they are helping me to experiment with the way that individuals can help teachers to teach better. And I think we have to teach science and show the power of it, as Kappa says, that it thrives on being doubted. I call it geo. I, I mean, I do logos. I mean, that's a logo for buckyballs down under. And this is one for the, the GEO, Global Educational Outreach. Um, now, why have I got a little bit of optimism? In summary, I think the Enlightenment is under threat as powerful and well-funded forces wage war on modern humanitarian philosophies and our values based on doubt, questioning, and reason, in particular the sciences. I don't know. The Center for Inquiry may have 25 million. It pours into insignificance compared to 400 million for the... Uh, Campus Crusade for Christ, and 88 billion which people put into the, the religious institutions on top of what they've already got. But we're still there. 